Many years ago, I asked Michael Jordan whether he had ever approached Larry Bird or Magic Johnson for career advice. His response wasn't exactly what I was expecting. I called Jordan up recently and brought it up again. I remember asking you once, hey, did you ever call Bird and Magic and say, hey, tell me the secret to being a superstar? And you you just laughed at me. <laughs> I'm laughing at you now. No, I never called them. I mean, I learned from afar. You know, I understood what they obtained in their careers and their personalities and the way they played. And I wanted to emulate them in terms of, you know, the way they were respected throughout the league. And then they started winning championships. They became a goal for me, you know? So I didn't get on the phone, hey, Magic, what do you think about this? Or Bird, what do you think about this? No, I didn't do that. I knew if I was gonna obtain it, I need to learn and do it myself. I need to do it myself. That's the NBA I've known for most of my career. I've been reporting on pro basketball since the mid 80s, when stars kept each other at arm's length. Back then, salaries were modest, and games were bruising. For guys like Jordan, other star players couldn't be his friends. They were obstacles on the road to a championship. That's what I believed until 2015, when I conducted two of the more memorable interviews of my career. It was winter, and Kobe Bryant was in his final season. He agreed to meet me at the Four Seasons Hotel in Boston to reminisce a bit. My hope was to tap into some of his lessons learned during his lengthy, complex NBA journey. I already knew he was a bit of a hoops thief, having sat down with him years earlier to watch old films of Oscar Robertson and Jerry West, so he could show me which specific moves of theirs he had pilfered. But what Kobe described to me during our late December lunch was on a whole new level. He explained in detail how he systematically stalked the greats of the game to gather intel on becoming the best. How Russell shared his art of war tactics that he used against his friend and rival Wilt. How Magic urged him to consider it a duty to contribute more to the game than just what he did on the floor. How Kareem turned him on to Bruce Lee and martial arts, which would assist him with his elusiveness and agility. How Bird offered insight on the mental tenacity required to challenge your teammates and how Akeem spent the whole day with Kobe breaking down his dream shake. It was a laundry list of legendary advice. But the most remarkable connection Kobe made was with Jordan, the man he obsessively tried to emulate and surpass. Jordan had long been insular in his pursuit of excellence, and for a time, Kobe was too. But, he told me, his relationship with MJ had blossomed. Jordan had schooled Kobe in the 1998 All-Star Game, referring to him as, quote, a little Laker boy. But Jordan was impressed. Come to find out, even before that well-publicized moment, he had already privately draped his arm around Kobe and said what Dr. J once told him. Do you ever need anything? Give me a call. So Kobe did. In fact, he told me on that winter day, they talked often. They spoke about everything, from how to hold off bigger players in the post, to how to manage the maniacal intensity that had come to define them both. When Kobe elbowed teammate Sasha Vujicic during practice, reducing him to tears, he called Jordan afterwards to see if he had gone too far. These conversations often lasted for more than an hour, sometimes in the middle of the night. This was stunning to me. The Jordan I knew didn't share his basketball knowledge this freely. So I called him, and he confirmed everything Kobe said. Jordan told me he advised Bryant, sometimes you have to be an asshole. Sometimes your teammates are going to hate you. When I pressed MJ on why he decided to let Kobe into his world, he told me he has that tunnel vision where you only think about winning not other people's perception of you. In other words, kindred spirits. At first, it was an irritant, but then secondly, it became, man, it's a sense of respect, you know, and I respect him for that. And if it was me, I'd probably do the same thing. 
The entire basketball universe learned of the depth of their friendship after Kobe's untimely death in 2020. A vulnerable Jordan, tears flowing, spoke at his funeral and explained the incredible personal loss he was experiencing. Maybe it surprised people that Kobe and I were very close friends. But we were very close friends. Kobe was my dear friend. He was like a little brother. I found myself thinking about those conversations with Kobe and Michael a lot lately. There are other moments that resonate with me too. LeBron's decision to take his talents to South Beach in 2010, and the Bucks' resolve to boycott a game during the pandemic bubble playoffs of 2020. Signs of a new NBA, one in which the players have gained so much independence, and a league in which the rising financial tide has made sure that everyone is handsomely paid. It's an evolution that lots of people contributed to, but none more than a small collection of NBA icons, players who became faces of the league and changed the paradigm of the NBA superstar on and off the court. Their willingness to pass along the lessons they learned to future generations has shaped the game and empowered today's NBA players in ways I never imagined. Some did it explicitly, others begrudgingly, and others more or less in secret like Jordan talking to Kobe in the middle of the night, helping his eager little brother to try to take away his throne. The story of the NBA is, in many ways, how these iconic players built the league into what it is today. Empowered players with seemingly endless cultural cachet and a platform to affect social change, playing for teams that are worth billions. And that's the story I'll be telling you over the next eight episodes. We'll start at the beginning. I said, it's Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain, and it's Oscar Robertson, and it's Jerry West, and it's Elgin Baylor. The NBA didn't want the ABA to merge with them. They wanted Dr. J. We all knew that. We'll watch a fledgling league grow into an entertainment powerhouse and an endorsement bonanza particularly after one specific player took flight. What Jordan Brand, what Nike did, was they went head to toe. They were going to dominate from head to toe. Every player today should love Michael Jordan. You know, rising tide lifts all ships. Michael was that rising tide. We'll hear the icons themselves reflect on their place among the all-time greats. Listen, I didn't win a championship, so magic, Larry, Michael, Kobe, LeBron, Kareem, you know, guys like that. We in the same building, but we're not on the same floor. And then we'll see how we got to the modern NBA and how today's stars continue to change the league in concert with each other, walking a path paved by the icons who came before. I admire these guys from afar. I follow their careers from afar through the internet, through books, through whatever. And at a certain point, once we cross paths, I'm sure we'll have a conversation or two. But if not, I still respect everything that these guys brought to the game. And I'm trying to leave my imprint on the game the same way. I've enjoyed this ride. I think you will too. <laughs>